So we've seen already how with the data, the aesthetic mapping, and the geometries, we can make lots of fairly nice, straightforward plots in ggplot2. But in this second video, we're going to look at how to extend some of that plotting, and specifically thinking about more types of aesthetic and colors, and how the scale functions work within ggplot2. So we're going to start looking at this data set that we've seen before, which is this representative sample of uh, Americans from 2018, or allegedly representative sample of Americans from 2018. So I'll give you a quick second to think about how this plot on the screen would have been created. What would the code have looked like to create this particular plot? So we've got box plots, we've got uh, income, uh, which is annual income on the y-axis, and we've got our age groups on the x-axis. So the code that we're going to have used to get to this point would have looked something like this, where we have our ggplot, we set our data, within the ggplot command we use the AES function, to map the y-axis of income, the x-axis of age group, and then remembering to close two brackets, our plus sign to move to the next line, and then our geom underscore box plot to make box plots. So when we come to start thinking, okay, what next was this plot? One of the first things that people want to do is think, ah, let's add some color to this. And there's a couple of different ways you can add color to ggplots. And some people tend to get a little bit confused sometimes, especially when they're learning for the first time. It's good to just go over those ways a little bit. The simplest way of adding color is to add it within the geom box plot function. So we can add within that function color equals red. And it's a color name should always be in quotation marks. What this does is it colors in the, the lines which make up the box and it colors the points in the color that we've specified. Uh, we have to pick a color which is a valid color name in R. There's a really nice uh, chart which has all uh, has about 500 or 600 different colors that you can specify by name in R. Uh, you can also use hex codes if you know how hex codes for colors work. And here, when we've specified this, it's perhaps not what we were expecting to see. I think often when we were thinking about the color and setting the color, we were expecting the boxes to be shaded in red rather than those lines of points to become red. And that's because within ggplot2, there's two types of color that we can specify. Color, as it is here, you can spell it with or without the U, a nice quirk of the person who wrote this package being from New Zealand, they let the correct spelling with a U be used, which is very nice. You don't often get that in programming languages. The other way is with fill. So with fill equals red, this denotes the color which the boxes will be shaded in. So we've got two different sets of color that we can play around with. Uh, of course, you can have both at the same time as well if you wanted. So you could have fill equals red and color equals blue. So we see that now we have the outline and colors in blue and we have the shading of the boxes in red. But what if, instead of just having one color for all of our bars, all of our boxes, what if we wanted to have different colors for each of our different age groups? And so here, this is where we don't have the static color like we have here. We actually want to use color or fill as an aesthetic because we want the fill color of the boxes to be mapped to one of the columns from our data frame. Uh, in this case, if we want different colors for different age groups, we'd want it to be mapped to age group. So we can write our code like this, where as well as having a y equals income and x equals age group within our aesthetic statement, we also set fill equals age group. We've got age group doing two things in this particular piece of code, because we want to set different colors based on the different values of age group within our data. And then we take everything out of geomboxplot and we just have that as the default settings within there. And this will give us a plot which looks something like this. So now we can see we've got different colors for each of our different age groups. And again, one of the really nice things about ggplot2 is you get pretty nice default color palettes. Those work pretty nicely for me. And you also get a pretty nice default legend created automatically. So it's worth remembering exactly how this color specification works because it's quite easy to get a bit mixed up and have static colors placed in the aesthetics or start mapping 
colors inside that geom box plot statement. Something that I always like to ask people when I'm teaching this material uh, in a real class rather than over a video is to try and work out without running the code or before running the code what they'd expect to see if we kind of mess it up a bit. So the first example here we put fill equals age group inside our geom box plot. And in the second case here, we put fill equals blue inside our aesthetics. So when I ask people what they expect would be the outcome, most people tend to get the first one right because they've been using R for a while at this point and they see that everything they do seems to give them errors. So this probably gives an error as well. And because age group is not a color or not something that R can recognize as a color, you're going to have a, an error at this point because it's got no idea what you're trying to tell it. It can't fill it in with the color age group, so an error is returned. The second option is kind of more interesting, though, because you, you tend to get a mix of some people will say that ah, nothing will happen, it will just ignore it. Other people will go with the error again. Maybe a third smaller group of people think, oh, it will work fine and just fill it in blue anyway. All three of these groups of people are wrong. This doesn't give an error, doesn't fill it in blue, it doesn't do nothing, it fills everything in red. And the reason why it fills everything in red, even though you told it to fill it in blue, is because here you're sort of mapping the fill aesthetic to a value. It's not recognizing blue here as a color, it's just seeing this as a value. And because it's a static value, there's no variability in just the word blue, it's saying, okay, all of the data is going to be set to the same color. And the default way that it sets colors is to just cycle through its default color palette. And the first color in its default color palette is red. So if we put fill equals blue in the aesthetics, this is why everything turns red. It doesn't have to be fill equals blue. We can put fill equals literally anything, and we would get exactly the same outcome here. So how do we decide to overwrite that default color palette. What do we need to change to actually make things the colors that we want to be, even if that default color palette is reasonably nice? To do this, we need to use the scale functions within R. And the scale functions are a little bit confusing to begin with because there seems to be a lot of them when you look in the documentation. But they all follow a very consistent pattern. These scale functions modify aesthetics. So all of the functions work in the same kind of structure where you have scale underscore, then the aesthetic, which you're modifying, and then an underscore, and then a modifier. So if we want to manually set the colors, we can have scale underscore fill underscore manual if we're talking about something which has been mapped to the fill aesthetic, or scale underscore color underscore manual if we're dealing with something which has been mapped to the color aesthetic. There's also a really nice function I'll show you in a second where we use the Brewer modifier instead, which is a way of accessing different color palettes. So for example, I, I've been bored and I've gone through the, the R color chart to see what colors seem cool and see what colors will go nicely together. And I've picked out uh, Beast, Chartreuse, Dark Salmon, Goldenrod Free, Hot Pink, and White Smoke. And I want to add these as the colors of my six boxes in my plot. The way that I do this is by, after my geom box plot, again, I'd be adding a plus to add an extra layer here, adding an extra function to be modifying the graph. And I would use scale underscore fill underscore manual. Within that function, I'd then be setting the values argument and then giving this list of colors, which I've picked out from the, the R color chart that I found online. Again, note that all these colors, they have to be in quotation marks. And we're using that C function that we've seen a couple of times already just to bring all of these six colors together. And we have to make sure we're giving the right number of colors at this point. If we've got six groups, as we do here, we need to give it six colors. And while this is one way of going about it, uh, the Brewer function, which I mentioned before, is perhaps an even better way of doing it because it can be quite difficult to manually pick out a nice complementary set of colors by ourselves. So the scale fill brewer function allows us to access a pre-built color palette. So instead of one that we're defining and we're defining all the colors in it, 
we're taking a palette which already exists. And you can check in the documentation for lots of these different kinds of color palettes that exist. You can have different shades of red, or you can have something which is a, a gradient between different colors. Two which I think are worth probably highlighting here are maybe the Dark 2 color palette. This is just one that I tend to use a lot because I think it works quite nicely. You get very bold, clear colors, and they all nicely distinguish from each other. Uh, and we've also got the grayscale color palette, which is called Grays, which is quite useful if you need to have a, a black and white friendly set of colors for your graph. And again, you see how this is specified with scale underscore fill underscore brewer in that new line. Instead of using the values argument that we use for scale fill manual, we're using the palette argument and then using the name of the color palette that we found from the list which are available. Scales don't just work with fill and with color. All aesthetics that we want to specify, they can be modified in a certain way. Uh, if we think of our X and our Y aesthetic, it's the same. Let's think particularly now for our Y aesthetic, because we're looking at our plots at the moment. They're looking quite nice. But one thing that's really jumping out to me is there's a lot of blank space in this graph because we've got income as our y variable. And income is distributed, I'm sure we all know, where just a very small number of people have a very large amount of income. And most of us are way down at the bottom of this chart here, uh, not earning quite so much income. So most of the action here is going on in the bottom 10% of this plot. So we can modify our y axis here to maybe be on a logarithmic scale. So the default for the y-axis, which we didn't need to set, as we also didn't need to set the, uh, the scale fills, is for having a continuous y-axis. But we can modify our y-axis in a very similar way by having scale underscore y underscore log 10 for saying, OK, let's now plot it on a log 10 y-axis. And we don't need to add any arguments in here to this particular function. You can see just opening and closing the brackets, and now we put everything on the y-axis. And this is really helping the presentation of our graph to really distinguish those differences between our six age groups that we've got. Now it's a much better use of space, it's much clearer to see the patterns, the plot just generally looks nicer. And again, see we're slowly layering up line after line. We've got two different calls to scale now, because we're accessing for the scale for fill and we're accessing the scale for y. We can only access a scale for each aesthetic one time, so we couldn't have a scale fill brewer and a scale fill manual layering up on top of each other, but we can have a separate scale specified for each of the aesthetics, which we've mapped earlier in our aesthetic statement. But just to recap some of those key points from this session, when we're talking about color within ggplot2, that's the colors of points and lines, and fill is what specifies the color when we're shading boxes or bars. And we can set those things as either an aesthetic then we're going to map it to a value from our data, or we can set it within the geometry if we're just setting it to be constant for all of the uh, plot points or bars or lines within our data. And then that scale modifies the aesthetic, and those functions all work in that scale underscore aesthetic underscore modifier format. And this lets you modify exactly how your axes are being plotted or what colors and shapes and lines might be being assigned.